Okay, so um, I'm doing two sessions here on document assembly. Um, not sure how I got hooked into the whole document assembly thing, but I've been doing it for a long, long time, actually back when WordStar and WordPerfect were around, right? Document assembly has been one of those challenging aspects of uh, the evolution of technologies. By the time you get figured it out, um, a new word processor is produced or some new standard comes out. Um, just a quick show of hands, how many people have actually done a lot of document assembly using OpenXML? So a fair number of you, but then there's about half, I think, who've not done any OpenXML? Show of hands? Okay. Um, just to get a sense for uh, how fast I should go. Um, for this session, I, I wanted to do a background, um, a little bit of um, you know, foundational stuff, um, and then focus in on some of the key techniques that you need in order to build your document assembly solutions, whether you're doing them in SharePoint or not. Okay? I do have a couple of demos where I'm just using a console app to push um, content into SharePoint. I'm not going to build a big elaborate feature you know, that pulls SharePoint data and all that. Because I've, I've, I, as I thought about this, this session, um, I had a sense that um, you know, with the platform stabilizing, uh, people are now getting a chance to play with OpenXML, whereas they hadn't really had an opportunity to do that before. So I wanted to focus more on the core concepts and introduce you to some of the um, important styles of building these kinds of apps and the trade-offs between them and the tools that are out there which have evolved. They continually evolve. Um, and there's um, a good body of work out there. Are you familiar with OpenXM, the OpenXMLdeveloper.org site? So I have a link here. It's, there's just a lot of rich information out there, code snippets, um, examples. But as you'll see, there's just a lot of ways to skin you know, this cat. Um, and so we'll just go into all of them. Uh, for those of you not familiar with me, um, I've been doing SharePoint for quite a number of years, and thinking a little bit beyond the platform is kind of my uh, trademark, right? So I'm always pushing the envelope um, for good and for, for bad, <laughs> right? Um, but uh, I have a deep interest in content analysis and content generation. Um, I have a background in law, and that's where all this in interest in content came from. So all the challenges that you can imagine the lawyers face when they're trying to produce contracts and those kinds of you know, complex documents with rules and things like that, that's kind of my background. Um, so now we're pushing it into SharePoint world. So when you look at um, OpenXML, um, I'm just going to dive right in here um, because <clears throat> you're dealing with basically a zip file but has a, that it has a specific structure. So any of the documents that, um, com that comply with this standard right, are going to have this same structure. The benefit being that we can have a, a layer of code that knows how to manipulate these kinds of documents. Okay? So the OpenXML standard really defines a packaging standard. Right? It, it defines a way to store content inside of that structure. Um, Prior to this structure, you know, in order to get hierarchies, which is really the essence of this, hierarchy of components that are related to one another, right, you can achieve that hierarchy with XML. Okay? But beyond that you know, sort of core XML language, you also have a container structure that defines particular components to be located in particular kinds of um, XML documents, each one driven by its own schema. Okay? So um, second question. I'm trying to get out of the light so I can see you. Um, how many have worked a lot with XML? OK. So when I say schema, it doesn't scare you, right? You know what I'm talking about. Um, and you know that there's been a lot of work just dealing with XML Right? in its 
in its growth and evolutionary path. Um, schemas are the way that these different types of components are being identified within the package file. So it's the actual schema um, URL itself that's being used to identify these components, which is convenient for the packaging API, right? It just uses the schema to validate the object and then loads the object, right? So um, the basic structure of an XM, open XML document follows, um, has these, let's see, am I working here? Can't see it. Um, it's kind of weird, this is really large. Um, you can see that you've got this document container at the top with a variety of document parts. Most of these parts are in XML, but some of them are in some sort of binary format, right? Um, or uh, Base64, right, for certain kinds of components, but most of them are just XML. And you can browse this structure easily using whatever tool can open that zip, zip package, right? The advantage being that you can access these components and manipulate them without using an Office product, right? Which offers the promise of being able to rapidly retrieve the information, find the information, modify it, and generate it, okay? Um, each one of these component parts, as I mentioned before, is validated against the schema. And um, that structure is consistent across different dialects of um, the OpenXML standard, right, that Microsoft has defined for Office products. If you look at the stack here from a different perspective, given that you're going to use that packaging format, you have different markup languages for the different products, which is um, one of the big challenges that you face when you start working with OpenXML, right, because you've got, for each product, you've got different interpretations of the packaging standard, right, as implemented by these um, markup languages. The other thing that you find is that <clears throat> these markup languages, while they are in XML, they really aren't intended for humans, okay? So a lot of that XML has been created by tools, and then they wrapped a schema around that, and so it makes it kind of difficult when you're approaching it, right? So here's the promise of a key technology that's going to have all of those capabilities that, you know, that are mentioned here, that you can generate documents, manipulate documents, et cetera. In theory, that's great. But when you get into it, then you find that each one of these dialects you know, is, is pretty substantial. You've got to learn the dialects, like learning a language. And you've got to learn the idiosyncrasies of each rendering component, meaning each office product. Right? Each one handles and processes that standardized packaging structure slightly differently, okay? And so then within that, there are different vocabularies for dealing with the different components that you can find within those documents. So there's even more dialect that you've got to learn. There's more that you've got to become familiar with. And it starts to feel like compiled basic after a while, right? Because you've just got to keep so much in your head when you're dealing with that raw XML. The open packaging convention is great, right? But these are the areas where you're really going to be spending most of your time. Um, and we're going to ignore you know, the, the retrieving of data, the mining of data from documents. We're really just going to focus on generating new documents using primarily word processing ML in this talk, right? I did um, a book a few years back for Microsoft um, when they were focusing on OBAs. Remember OBAs, right? Office Business Applications. And um, they asked me to, to focus on OpenXML, so I did that. And when I, when I approached it that time, again, I mentioned that I pushed the envelope a lot. I was looking for a consistent UI, I mean, a consistent API that I could layer on top of these three distinct markup languages so that I could work with the data independently of how it's going to be generated and generate different kinds of documents. Like I could generate a presentation and a spreadsheet and a Word document using the same core API. I found that to be extremely challenging, right? Extremely challenging. Why? Well, there are some concepts in word processing ML that just don't exist in the other two. 
there's a very nice concept that's introduced in word processing ML. Anybody want to tell me what it is? <coughs> I know you're all awake because you're looking at me, right? Content controls, right? We all, know, we all know what content controls are, right? Content controls turn out to be the basic building block for doing anything with content generation in Word, in Microsoft Word, right? Using Word Processing ML. There's no such concept in Spreadsheet ML. There's no such concept in Presentation ML. So if you're going to try to build some sort of reusable API that you're going to use over and over again to generate your documents, you can't rely on the nice content control concept, you've got to create some other kind of placeholder for each one of these other markup languages. I say that just to give you a sense for how, how different they are, right? If you work with them, you end up, in fact, when I generate spreadsheets, I don't use OpenXML, right? I use the old Excel 2003 XML format, right? It's much quicker, much easier, right? Now, you know, I said that. <laughs> Right? But it's true. Okay? These presentation formats are powerful, but at the same time, they're challenging. And I just haven't decided to invest the energy in building the same kind of APIs that I, that I use for word processing ML that I, do, that I would for, for spreadsheet, because it's quicker. Okay? Presentation ML is a little bit different, because um, it's, you know, it's got this paradigm This is just slides, essentially, right? So it's easy to work with. Spreadsheets, not so easy. Right? You know, calculations, you've got all kinds of stuff that's in there. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the model that you use to generate documents. Um, and we're going to start with a push model, right? Where we have data and we're pushing it into the, to the application, right? That's sort of the first thing that you come to when you look at how you might use um, OpenXML. Um, but then, you quickly realize that as the content becomes more complex, you need to go to a pull model because the template becomes overbearing, right? It affects performance, it, it affects throughput, it, it affects complexity, right? If you can shift to a model that's analogous to jQuery, right, where you've got um, the browser handling the DOM for you and you're just telling it where to put stuff and then you've got some other layer feeding that content in, that's a much more efficient and reusable model. Okay, so back to the open XML standard. Parts and relationships, right? So quickly you understand that there are these relationships between these components. So the, the, the idea is that you've got document parts that can live anywhere, right? Because it's a hierarchical structure. You've got document parts that can be in a tree somewhere, and so you need to reference it, right? But those document parts may reference other parts. So the idea is that you basically have a directory structure with a schema being used as to identify um, objects that are related to one part, right? And using that relationship type attribute to specify how it's related. And that's generalized across the package, okay? And that ID can be any string that's unique, but typically you'll find that it's, it's a pretty long string, but um, guaranteed to be unique because of that type, that schema type, right? And then, you know, any of these open XML part schemas, here's an example of what one would look like, right? So this is saying that this is a um, style sheet that's related to this particular part and then the target part, right? Very simple structure, very consistent, and very efficient. So you'll find that the packaging API can find these components pretty quickly. Um, the open packaging API has, um, let's see, I think I'm missing a slide here. Hold on. Let me check one thing real quick. Good. Okay. So the open packaging API 
is basically the, the low-level um, set of components that Microsoft uses with the SDK, which we'll see in a minute. But this is the lowest level um, access that you'll have to uh, manipulating these documents. Right? So here's an example of how we would work with this API. And you can see that it's a pretty low-level API. It's similar to just opening a file, but you're using the packaging API. The key here is that there are lots of steps involved when you're creating real documents. And if you're going to use the open packaging API, you've got to deal with the fact that um, typically you are going to be creating the entire document. Right? It's hard to start with some existing content. Right? Because otherwise, you'd have to navigate, find, replace using the packaging API, which takes a lot of code. Um, and so I think the best way to, to get into that is to look at some code that uses the open packaging API. So let me just bring up Visual Studio here, and we'll look at it. Can you read that in the back? Is that, should I zoom it up? Yes or no? I should zoom it up? OK. <laughs> All right. So I'm just going to walk through some of this stuff, right? Um, so here's the raw packaging API. So here's a project here. It's just a console app. But it sort of gives you a sense for what you're dealing with, right? And this is one that's going to push some, push some generated code, some generated document into SharePoint, right? But you can see here that I'm just um, using these namespaces, system.io, just to pull up the files and stuff. But system.io.packaging, right, is that raw packaging API. And it's analogous to using system.io, OK? So, what you have to do here, just to walk through this code um, really quickly. Do I need to zoom it up more? I always ask, because no one says anything. Huh? Can you see it? Huh? I couldn't hear you either. <laughs> Sorry. I'll just keep going, and if there's a problem, you let me know. All right. Zoom it in again. I need to zoom it out again? Yeah, OK, thanks. Oh, it, it lost my zoom. What happened there? There we go. That makes sense. So let me uh, close these out. All right. So here you see at the top, I've just defined this, um, the word namespace, right? which is the word processing ML. Um, this is old code, but it's still the same. Um, and I'm going to close this region just to focus in on what we're doing here. I'll come back to those. All right. So I've got our local site set up. I can open that site up. Um, I'm running this on. Windows 7, so it's a little finicky. Um, OK. So it's a simple idea, right? We're, we're going to have, as soon as this comes up, so I've got a contacts list, right, with a few contacts in it, OK? And it's just on the site. So all we're going to do is generate a letter to one of these contacts. And if I look at the code, so all I want to do is generate some simple text, right? Just a simple letter in Word. And I want to put it in a document library. Um, so I just got a string here to define the letter body. I'm just going to open up the site, right? find the contact list, extract data from the content contact list. Right? So we've got the data. So now we've got a bunch of strings that we're going to push into this letter. Okay. We're going to create a target library if it doesn't exist, and then figure out where these documents are going to be 
when I push it into the SharePoint site, you're understanding this code, right? Makes sense, okay? And then um, here's where it starts to get a little bit more interesting. We're gonna create a new package in a memory stream, right? And we're using the packaging API there, right? So I just create a memory stream and then package that open, that document stream, creating a new file, right? But we're using the packaging API. So this is a smart version of the file I.O. that understands the packaging structure, right? It's gonna take care of all the compression, it's gonna take care of all the organization of everything, create our zip file and call it whatever we, we wanna call it and it's gonna follow that packaging convention, right? So now we're gonna generate a docx file Right, from the list content that we're pulling out of SharePoint. So we have to you know, create some XML, right? but this is a URI that's gonna be a relative URI inside that package. Okay? So what we're gonna create is one of those document parts called the package part. So we tell the package to create that part, give it the URI, which tells it where in that package this content is going to live, Right? And we have to specify the content type, and that's the key sort of magic cookie there that says that it's a word processing document. Right? And now we've got the package part. Right? Now we can work with the package part in the same way we might work with a file. Right? We create a stream writer, right? just get the stream from the part. So the packaging API is allowing us to work with the Word document as though we were working with a file. Then we just get an XML writer, now we're back to XML. We create our XML writer on that stream part, which is on that stream, which is just a stream writer here, and then write the components. We have to write the right stuff in there or it won't understand it, right? So there's the packaging and then there's the dialect that we're using to communicate with Word, okay? So these are sort of magic components, the W, the document, the word namespace from the top, right? The body, the word namespace, right? So we're writing these and we're identifying them using that word namespace and then here we're creating a new paragraph component and you can see that it's a fairly low level API, right? If you start building large documents, you're working at, at even smaller than paragraphs, you're working at the run level, okay? Remember I said that I was, you know, challenge to do an API that dealt with Word and say PowerPoint, let's ignore Excel for the moment. Part of the problem was the way that Word handles runs. Word may split a run arbitrarily, right, based on its requirements. So for example, if you wanted to use some sort of methodology where you, you wanted to have placeholders inside of a template, and you wanted those placeholders to have um, sort of unique identifiers and you came up with a scheme that says dollar sign, you know, company name dollar sign and just placed it in Word, that wouldn't work because Word might break it into two runs and you wouldn't be able to find it even as an XML process, right? Okay, whereas PowerPoint might break it also, right? If you bold, if, if someone comes in and bolds just one character in that token, PowerPoint will split it into a different run because it's got to know, it's got to record that that character is bold so it's not going to be your token. So the challenge um, without having some controlling component like a content control is to figure out how to create templates in um, a, a presentation application that has free reign to manipulate those components, right? It's the packaging API that can go and find these things, but it's you who has to define um, what, you know, what you're talking about. So now, you know, I, I deliberately hid that because now we created the paragraph, and now we have to write the paragraph properties. Right? We can't just write the text. We've got to structure the paragraph, and a paragraph in word processing ML has a certain structure. It has paragraph properties, it has spacing, it has lines, it has rules, it has styling, all that stuff, and you have to put that in, okay? There's nothing to help you know that stuff. Then you have to create a run for the address content and put the address lines in there. Then you have to create another paragraph for the date. Then you have to create a new paragraph for the salutation, right? And then the letter body, and then the closing salutation, right? Then the user's name, then the body, and then you finally close the document. 
you have to remember to flush it, right, because um, it might be cached. And then you have to create the relationship part, right, which tells Word where to find all of that information. Okay? All of that just to write this text. Right? This is the body of the letter, right? So I'll just run this. Okay. It'll go out to SharePoint. It'll find the contacts list, right? It'll find the contact with that last name. It'll create the document. It'll drop it into the document library, right? So now if I go and look at my site content, right? I've got open XML SDK letters. I've written a letter to Wiley Coyote, and if I open it in Word, much ado about not much, okay? So, um, let's see. Where is it? Okay, all right. Simple, but tedious, correct? Right? I mean, for those of you who've done OpenXML, you know, are you using the Open Packaging API? Probably not, right? Okay, so questions? Let's move forward. All right, let's go back to the slides. So that's the Open Packaging API, right? So that brings the question, you know, when you're gonna build OpenXML solutions, what strategy will you pursue, right? You want to have a consistent architecture. You want to enable declarative templating because that's going to be much more efficient for you. You want to enable code reuse, but you've got some, some challenges, right? If you look at the, you know, the markup language is unique. You have to anticipate the need to repurpose data across types, but that's not so easy to achieve. And the rendering mechanisms are unique for each type. So what are the tools? We have the Open Packaging API, but we also have the Open XML SDK. Um, which has evolved quite substantially over the last couple of years. And there's another neat device that we can use called the OpenXML SDK Productivity Tool. That one is useful for two purposes, right? And that is that you can get insights into the structure of existing documents. Let's say you've got a challenge and you want to build something complex like a statement of work. Right? And you've got an example of one. You could pop open this productivity tool to get a sense for the structure of that document before you start working. Um, uh, you can also do some other things with it that I'm going to show you. Um, whether or not you actually still want to use the Open Packaging API after doing that is, is, a, is an open question. But um, for this session, we're going to consider three distinct approaches to building documents using OpenXML. In the next se session, we'll consider another one which I consider to be superior to these three. Um, you could use the Open Packaging API, but you've got the advantages and disadvantages that we just saw. The advantage is that you can perhaps use a code generation tool to jumpstart your project, like the productivity tool that I'm going to show you in a minute, right? Because what, one of the things that it does is really pretty cool is it will reflect the document and generate code that you can use as a starting point to build raw packaging API type solutions. Okay, and that's useful for one-off types of scenarios. It's not so useful for reusability, but it's useful to get the job done if you've inherited a document and you really don't have the time to structure a complete API around it. You've just got this document. You want to make some changes and you want to throw it out. Or you've got this document and you want to retrieve data from it. It's a useful tool for that. Um, difficult to understand and modify um, the code, right? Because you, you, you're going to need a tool to help you if you're going to use that. But the other disadvantage here for using the Open Packaging API is that you typically have to build the whole thing, right? And it takes a long time. You saw that that simple document took a little while, right, when it was running. The Open Packaging API was processing, looking for document parts, creating things in the right place, doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes, compressing it, doing all that stuff, right? And that takes a little bit of time, so your throughput may suffer if you take an approach that requires you to regenerate boilerplate content all the time, unnecessarily, right? 
So if you could shift to a templated model, you wouldn't have to generate all that boilerplate. You'd just be pro providing the, the change, and it would be much faster. Okay? You can use the open XML SDK. Um, if I were going to start building um, documents uh, without considering these other alternatives, that's where I would start because the SDK has really come along and you've got some high-level concepts that you can work with easily. It provides wrappers for all of this stuff, but it provides um, semantic wrappers that are specific to each product that make a lot of sense, right? So it's intuitive to use, easy to work with the code. Um, but there is quite a bit of a learning curve, as I was mentioning before. Each one of these products has its own requirements, and it's still not that fast. Right? It's still doing the packaging. It's sitting on top of the packaging API. Right? So, um, you know, if you've got a big team and you're managing a big team and they're doing open XML, then it makes sense to have an SDK. Another approach that was introduced by Eric White, who used to be with Microsoft, familiar with the name Eric White, right? OpenXMLDeveloper.org. He's prominent with that. Used to work with Microsoft, now he's independent. He came up with an idea that said, well, why don't we just flatten the whole thing out into one big XML file, right? It has this, some code that you can just download, OPC to flat, flat to OPC, right? So the idea is that you take um, an existing docx file, let's say, and you run it through a transform that just flattens it out into one big XML file without the separate files, okay? Um, because if you look inside of a zip, if you open a docx file, just rename it to .zip and open it up, you'll see that it's not just one big file. It's got a lot of little files in the hierarchy, in the zip file, right? Well, his idea was that it would be a lot easier to transform that XML if you had just one big XML file. So he has a tool called OPC, the Office you know, Format to Flat, which produces... Um, a big XML file, and then you can just use XSLT, right, to do your transform, right? You define your style sheet, you transform that XML into a new version of it with the substitutions all done, everything done, and then you convert it back with flat to OPC, and then save it as, an, as a docx file. Um, it's very fast, right? This approach is actually very fast. When you're, when you're flattening the document, you're not resolving references, right? You're just top to bottom flattening it out, and it goes very quickly. The transform itself, you know, is very quick with XML, right? Disadvantages, you gotta really know XSLT, right? Writing those style sheets is not gonna be a simple task. You're not writing C Sharp anymore, you're writing XML, XSLT, and it's gotta be precise, so it's, you know, it's a big iterative process there. Once you've got that style sheet done, though, you've got a very fast transformation mechanism. So this is another tool that you can use. I'm going to show you an example of um, a tool that I built taking this approach. Um, so let's move to the OpenXML SDK, right? So you've got these different classes now. So for each of the markup languages, you've got a top-level class that represents that markup, and then within that, you've got wrapper classes for all the known document parts. You've got wrapper classes for um, the uh, Office doc types, and uh, you've got individual schemas that refer to each one of those. So let's take a look at what that looks like in code. So let's see. So here we're going to do the same basic thing and generate a letter and let's zoom it up again so you can see it. And you can see here that um, I'm not bringing in the packaging I.O., right? I'm bringing in document format open XML packaging and the word processing uh, wrapper classes, okay? Same idea before. We're looking for a particular contact, right, okay, 
we're going to do the same body. We're opening it up. We're gra grabbing the same information from the contact list and all the rest. But now when we get here, we're going to create a document stream like we did before. Right? But now we've got wrappers that help us create the components. Create a memory stream, but now we create a word processing document object. And instead of talking to the packaging API, we don't see that at all. And we just tell it to create into our document stream a document. And we have word processing document type. We can add a document part. We're calling here the, the main document part. Right? We're just calling this the letter. Right? And there's a method for doing that. And then what's nice about it is we've got this nice fluent UI we can use that allows us to easily understand what it is that we're doing, right? Just create a new document, and in that document, create a body, and in that body, create a paragraph and a run. We still have these same concepts, but it's much easier to work with. You just put the text in there, create as many runs as you want in the paragraph, create another paragraph, another one, another one, another one, right? It's the same thing we were doing before, but now we've got a better UI for, I mean, a better API for, for working with it, right? And you get down to the bottom, you just save the document, close it, and then add it to the site, right? Same idea, much easier to understand and work with. But don't be fooled, <laughs> OK? These are very simple documents that we're working with. When you start working with complex documents, the whole user experience will change, right? Um, so let's uh, go out here. What do we got? So it rewrote that. Let's see. You see it's really 4.47 AM. OK. <laughs> right? Same document, right? Same content. OK? All right. So let's go back to the slides again. This OpenXML productivity tool is one that you really should have, free download, right? Part of the SDK. It's great for figuring out the structure of the document and for seeing the elements that are there, but it also has this pretty neat code generation capability built in. So. If I run that tool and I've opened a document, right, you just open the file, it gives you this nice tree view of the structure of the document. So if you're studying um, anything to do with OpenXML, right, can you see that? Um, these different components are, you know, those different document parts. You can see that there's a document properties. Um, seg section here. And within that, you've got you know the template, the time, the pages, all that stuff is in there. But that's not where the, the content lives. Okay, um, content lives down here in the Word document XML, and that's the string that we passed to the packaging API before. We we're trying to work with this, right? And you can see that you've got um, a bunch of settings, and then you've got the the actual W colon document component down here, and within that, the body and paragraphs, right? So this is the basic structure of a document that I opened, right? But there's nothing over in the right side until you say reflect code. This is when it gets kind of cool, right? It quickly goes out and reflects and gives you this nice split panel and generates the code that's needed in the bottom to produce that part, right? So now you can browse the document and it'll reflect that part and generate the code at the same time, right? So if you wanted to, um, you know, focus in on the content down here, let's say there's this paragraph. Remember, this is a simple document here, company name and all. You get a generated class at the bottom, which is the code that's needed, right, to produce that component, right? So you can easily create. So the, the style of working with this tool is that you're creating a template 
but you're creating the template to focus in on a portion of the template to use that to produce it in your, in your document, right? So you can have this elaborate template, but you're really only interested in three paragraphs, and you want those paragraphs to be dynamically created, right? So you open the document in this tool, you find that paragraph, those three paragraphs, and you just select it, and it generates the code that's needed to produce those paragraphs. Then you start from there, and you go in and edit the code to replace the runs with the text that you want, right? For example, here it would be fairly simple for me to change this text in this code to something else. Maybe code, maybe text that I'm pulling from some database or something like that. So if you're creating, depending on the kinds of documents that you need to create, right? If they're not that complex, there's not a lot of styling components that you need to, to, deal, to deal with, this is a decent way to actually get the start of code. And you can do that repeatedly for the different parts of the template that you're working with and end up with some code fairly quickly, right? So you're not starting from scratch. And it's working against the um, SDK, right? So you can see here that this version of the tool is working against the latest version of Word, right? And you've got, um, you know, tremendous amount of detail going on in here, right? Because you're, you're specifying all these different things. And I'm going to talk about the SDT in a minute. Um, but you get the idea, right? Great tool for exploring existing documents and converting sections of the document into code that you can reuse in your solutions. All right. Okay. So now, let's get to a more interesting idea. This flattening and transforming of um, XML using XSLT, right? Basic idea is that, that um, I mentioned before. Um, I'm going to show you and talk through uh, a different solution. So this solution has a slightly different structure, okay? So now we're getting into some more real world types of things. So the challenge here was, um, uh, at one point I was writing a lot of books, okay? And it was frustrating for me to work with, with, uh, with editors, <laughs> right? Because the, the cycle was just too long. And so, you know, being very interested in document generation, I thought, well, what if I just created an XML schema to describe the book? Right, um, and then created an XSLT transform to convert the XML into the format that they needed. You know, the, the editors have these specific formats that they want you to follow, and it have, has to have certain font and style, and you, you know, I just didn't want to spend a lot of time dealing with that. I wanted to just focus on writing the book. So for me, that means writing XML. So, um, you know, what would that mean in reality is that I could work with something that looks like this, right? I could just say, okay, I want to create an XML file that defines my chapter. So here's a chapter generator tool that I wrote um, <clears throat> where I could just define all the different pieces using sort of recognizable um, HTML type things like paragraphs and notes, images and sections. So, you know, right? Makes sense? This is useful just to push um, content out. So what did I need in order to make that happen? I needed a um, well-defined schema for my chapter definition. How come I'm not getting a view code? Okay.
And this is um, sort of the foundation for the next seg segment, too, as well, is that um, what I've found is that when you're working with open XML, and you know, obviously you're working with XML um, content coming in, you're merging content in from some XML-defined schema, right? So why not create your own schema and start there when you're building your solutions, okay? So if you're generating documents, and that, that, that applies even if whether you're going to edit the XML or you're going to pull the XML from somewhere else like SharePoint, right? InfoPath uses that model, right? You can load an XSD into InfoPath and it will define how the data is structured. So same idea here. Um, so here we have a pretty simple X, XSD that defines a chapter definition. You can see all the different elements, right? You can see that I was working for rocks at that time. And um, you got part definition, chapter definition, but not that complex, right? Just a few different elements in each of the different sections and each, each of the different components, but there are a good number of them. The challenges were um, how to um, consistently deal with uh, images and tables and things like that, right? Um, and also how to change the template that this was going to be fed into because, you know, rocks could change their minds about what the formatting needed to be for this particular type of, doc, type of book, right? So I was going to have to deal with the fact that the template might change, okay? So as an example of that, right, here's a chapter template. And notice that it's just a docx file, right? So what I wanted to, as another requirement was, I wanted to be able to embed into a resource pool the actual template so that if they gave me a new template, I could just load it in there and then just rebuild and I wouldn't have to spend any more time because the XML would map in easily. So I needed a way to convert that docx file to XML using the OPC to flat mechanism, right? So I open it up as a docx file, convert it to um, XML, right? do my transform, write it back out with the content merged in. So that push, pushed me to being able to manipulate this standardized, schematized XML from within the style sheet, okay? And there's one um, innovation that Microsoft brought along when building style sheets, right? And you can see I've just got two little um, style sheets here. One is chapter to word, right? But the other one is to do some fix-ups that are required after that transform happened. I learned that along the way. Um, if I open this style sheet up, it's not that bad. You know, I mean, it's a lot of stuff in here, but one of the interesting pieces is the ability to call into my C-sharp code during the transform, right? That was the key, okay? The Microsoft XSLT, right, it allows you to define namespaces, right? You can see here that MSXSL, script language C-sharp, right? That allows me to actually reference classes in my C sharp code from the XSLT style sheet while the transform is happening. That means that I'm shifting from a push to a pull model because the transform is asking for the data that it needs when it needs it, and I just have to supply it with that data in order to get the result that I want. The rest is just standardized um, XSLT stuff, right? So you can see here, I've just got a simple set of templates and you can see here now that I'm matching the elements that are defined in my schema in my XSLT style sheet. And as I go further down, you start to see things that look like word processing ML, right? I've got paragraphs, I've got runs, I've got all the different elements that are there, but merged with the content that's being pulled from my schematized data. Make sense? Right? So the challenges with this approach are that you still have to work pretty closely with the word processing ML, right? And it has to be properly structured. 
Okay, where did I get this in for this content? Using that productivity tool. Okay, I took the template, I opened it up in productivity tool, I browsed until I found an example that looked like the structure that I needed, and I just copied that structure into my style sheet and then manipulated it there. It's analogous to the generated C sharp code where I would replace some stuff in there, but I'm using the XML as my XSLT style sheet, right? It wasn't that difficult. It took a little while to sort of get the hang of what Word was expecting, but that was part of the process of learning the word, process, word processing ML dialect more than anything, okay? But you can see here that once I have them, and some of them wouldn't work, you know, you, you do it one at a time and it would work, and then you'd introduce another uh, concept and it wouldn't work. The, the hardest part was manipulating the images Okay, because as you're writing a book, you know, you've got captioned images and you've got to put the caption in the right place. You've got to move the things around. You've got to size the image and all the rest. But let's take a look at how the code looks uh, from the top level. This is another console app. It's, it's not going to push anything into SharePoint, but, um, uh, you know, command line stuff that I can ignore for the moment, right? You can see here when it runs, it parses the command line, but then it gets to a point where um, we create the document, right? After we processes, process these items, you're processing the file. The process file method, let me close this out so you can see the code. Okay. It looks a little similar to what we just saw, right? We're going to create a memory stream like we did before, okay? But we're going to copy that stream from an embedded resource, which is that chapter template, right? Now we've got the memory stream that holds the chapter template. So we're not starting from a blank template. We're starting from an existing one. So instead of calling the create method, we're going to call open it on that result stream. Right. So essentially, you just preload the stream with your template, and then open it, and now the word processing document is, um, contains the content of the pre-existing template. Okay. So now we need to find, do some things to figure out where the target's going to go, but then we open up our source data file, okay, and we pointed at that style sheet. This is again going to pick up another embedded resource, but it's going to pick up that chapter to Word XSLT style sheet, and we're going to feed it the document part, which represents the main document part for the document, and have it do the transformation in that document part. Right? So now the document part is going to be converted based on whatever content is in that XML file, and then we're going to create a new stream for the output. Right. Again, getting the document stream. Now we've got. Now when we get the document stream, it's already been um, converted, and we then just uh, uh, transform it again here using the fixups. Right, the fixups were to deal with um, references that w could not be known during the first transformation. Right, that word still expects to be resolved. Since we're using a mechanism that's transforming using XSLT, right, we couldn't do it using the normal style of, of uh, creating the objects. We're transforming the XML sort of behind the back of Word, right? Behind, you know, the, the SDK doesn't know, right? And so let's say we've created an image and we've placed it somewhere in the document. And when we do that, we've created an ID that is associated with that image part. We have to do another transformation to fix up the, the, the missing relationship, right? Because the SDK would have put it in there. Now we have to put it in there, and we have to use an XSLT transform since we're doing that. So there was a simple fix-ups um, uh, process that resolves those references, but once we've done that, now we've got a completely... Um, embedded uh, set of IDs, but without the actual images, right? So the sequence here, right, we do the fix-up so that the reference is there. Now the reference is expecting 
to find the bits in a particular location. Okay? So now, you know, there was one option for this console app to say whether I wanted to embed the images or not. If so, then I'd have to go and tell the image manager to go and get the image file and put it in the proper location based on what the document expects to see. Okay? So this is another sort of fix up that has to happen there at the end. And then you have to generate the fi figures after your images are there, right? Because you don't know how big they are. Right? You have to figure out the dimensions so that Word will understand that. And so there's a sequence that you have to follow if you're going to use this approach. Again, driven by the way that Word is structured. But once you've done it once, it basically works the same way every time. So just to run it, if you look at the content, how are we doing on time? At the end yet? What time? What time is it? Six minutes? I'm over time. OK, so let me just run it. How many are staying for the second session? OK, so it's not, not a big deal, right? Um, so you see that it generated this content, right, with um, the structure that you know, Rox was expecting just from this XML, and if I show you the XML, right, it's the same, I think you saw it already, it's sample XML, right? And it was pretty quick, right? It was faster this way than it was the other time, right? Because we're just manipulating the XML. It's faster, but we created a much more substantial document, right? You're gonna see an even faster um, process, well, actually not this fast, um, but the, the document is much more complex in the next session, right? So that's it for this session. We come back in 15 minutes. We'll start the second one, okay? <laughs>